uh, he's been uh, across the East. I tell you what, I am excited about what we've been doing missions-wise. We're still doing what we're supposed to do in India, Sri Lanka, uh, even though their countries are really, in, uh, Sri Lanka is really still facing some very difficult times, but we are, are, are blessed by that. You guys have been wonderful. Those of you at home who have been sowing in, we have been consistent through the pandemic. This church has not closed. Our missions are still going. We're still taking care of our responsibility. I thank God we took in a new responsibility. We did our part uh, with the, um, re this, the, the, the relocation of, of uh, Ukrainians here. I thank God for Melissa and all those, Wanda and everybody that worked our distribution center out here. That went well. And then Bishop uh, Kunji is taking it to another level with our um, uh, uh, Russian pastor going to the hot spots, having to wear flak vests and all of that kind of stuff to get into uh, different parts of the Ukraine. Uh, again, I say to all of my Americans, you cannot go uh, to this trip. You're not allowed to go on the trip because it will be nothing but an international incident in an American soldier. Uh, if you're not a soldier and you're not a part of DOD and you don't have a DOD ID card, go for it. But if, if that's your calling, I've been in missions for 21 years. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, and if, you, if you're not, um, if your heart's not in it, uh, you'll offend people. Uh, you, you will offend. Paul said, I'll eat what they put before me. If you're not able to do that, don't, don't go because it can be very offensive. Can you grab your Bibles this morning? Uh, we're going to declare how we're going to receive the word. First lady's back in town. Yeah. My wife been gone two whole months. Well, not two. I got to see her for two weeks, but two, two months she'd been gone away from the house. Uh, when she came back, she did not evict me. <laughs> there was nothing growing in places and nothing like that. No, I didn't break anything. I didn't break nothing. Everything outside and inside was good. Yep, and I did a good job. I had some help, but I did a good job. <laughs> All right, let's grab the Bibles and declare how we received the word this morning. Say, this is my Bible. Come on, say it like it's yours. Or if you need a Bible, lift your hand. We'll get you one. Say, this is my Bible. It is God's holy word. Jesus said, that it's spirit and it is life. Therefore, I cannot receive this word with my natural mind or my carnal intellect. Jesus, sow this word into my spirit. I shall and I will receive it. I do want to give a shout out to, have a seat now, to Miss Phyllis, who really has done a good job with our children's church. They're out on vacation this week or out this week or whatever, but I thank God for her. She has done a good job. I want to, I want to we, we talked last week about this is the year of restoration, and, and we talked about restoration of hope, restoration of glory. Uh, we've talked about a different, different subjects along the way, but I'm talking now about uh, the restoring lost years, restoring wasted years. And, 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 and I want to start by, by simply, you know, asking some questions and then, and then we'll get right into what it is we want to do. I said, you know, well, first of all, you know, as I always say, in order to get anything from uh, anything you're trying to learn or trying to do, I think it's very important that, number one, you get a revelation. Somebody shout revelation. If you get a revelation about whatever the subject is, whatever the thing you're trying to accomplish, if you get a revelation, if you get a revelation, you can get what it is that you're trying to do because God provides revelation. And it's insight that is the wisdom of God. Number two, I think if you can get a role model, if you can find somebody that you can pattern, you know, a role model. You know, when you 
you're more apt to do it if you see someone else do it. Mm -hmm. I mentioned on last week, I mentioned uh, the, the breaking of the record of the mile. Remember uh, when I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, that mile record was not being broken. It was crazy. Then all of a sudden now, we got guys running a marathon, breaking, breaking that record. <laughs> that was, inside of the marathon, they, they're breaking that old record that was seemed like it was insurmountable. It couldn't be broken. Y'all know what I'm saying. I remember, you know, when uh, I was watching basketball in the 60s, it wasn't not allowed. It just, they, could, they just didn't do it, you know, you know dunking the basketball. Then we get Spud Webb dunking the ball at five foot six. I mean, that was crazy. Five foot six dunking a basketball and winning the dunk contest. That's crazy. So everybody can dunk now, huh? We watch women's basketball forever. And women, now women can dunk in the game. I mean, it's amazing. Once, it's, once, I, once you've seen it done, it's attainable. So somebody set out role model. Next, you got to have, I believe, a regimen of faith. If you don't have, without faith, it's impossible to please God. No matter what it is you're trying to do, I don't care if it's a business, I don't care if it's, if it's your classwork, I don't care whatever it is you're trying to do. These four things will help you if you've got a regimen of faith. That means you're consistent in your understanding and your commitment to God and to, to, to being faithful. You, you got that? And number four, somebody say resolve. You got to have a righteous resolve. No matter what I'm faced with, no matter what it looks like, no matter the obstacle, I'm going to press on. You got to have a righteous resolve. All right, so this morning, if you got those things in mind, I, wanna, I want to just ask a few questions as we, we, we go through here. On last week, I asked the question, you know, how many years have you wasted in your life before you repented and surrendered, surrendered everything to Jesus? How many years of your past life were eaten up by the canker worm and by sin of rebellion? Everybody knows that, that sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. But wouldn't you love to get back those years <laughs> and live them really for the glory of God? I think that's one of the main things that happens when you get saved. You reckon, boy, mm, I wish I'd done it a long time ago. Those of us who have excellent uh, marriages, huh? I didn't say perfect, I said excellent. There's a difference between excellent and perfect. Those of that, that have excellent marriages say to ourselves, you know, even though I say this, this is really, it's good. You know, it's good theory, but it's not doesn't make a lot of good sense, though, really. I say, you know, I wanted and I said, boy, I wish we were married instead of going on heading toward 40 years. I wish we were married 55 years. Now, that sounds good. But 55 years ago, I wasn't ready for her. <laughs> I would have messed it up. Y'all didn't hear me what I'm saying. Uh, I would, it, it, you know, say I'll, I'll just talk to y'all at home because they ain't working with me. They're trying to act like they had it all together and they, them and they, they would be together. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You have to be ready for what God has for you. And if all things work together for the good of the Lord, I believe the time we got together was the good and the perfect time uh, for that. Amen. I want to turn this morning in our Bibles to the book of John, St. John's chapter number eight. And I want to use this text. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about the, I love this text because the text helps us to understand what I want to deal with today uh, in part two of our teaching is, 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 is restoring joy by getting rid of guilt and shame. We have to alleviate and eliminate guilt and shame. Look at, look at, look at uh, John chapter 8 and verse 1. It is the story uh, that you all know. Uh, we don't have to turn there. I want you to turn there, but not on the screen because I'm just going to paraphrase, it is the story of Jesus who uh, went to the Mount of Olives and uh, verily, he got there to the temple 
And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman that was caught in adultery. Y'all know the story. This woman was caught in adultery, and the Bible says that uh, she was guilty, and she got caught in the very act, it said. In other words, this was not rumored that she was. They saw her in the act. No excuse, no way out. You know, this may not be your situation, but guilt and shame is something that plagues just about every believer at one point in their Christian walk. Have you ever dealt with this same kind of guilt and shame? Have you ever dealt with guilt? or a feeling that is so, because you made such a horrible mistake and you don't believe that God could forgive you. Now, you, you, you know, you made such a horrible mistake that God would never, you know, it's amazing how we do in society, even when we look at the woman caught in adultery isn't it amazing how we look at this text and we see the woman, show me what a dude was. She didn't commit adultery by herself. Isn't it amazing how society, what we do with our boys and what we do with our girls is two different things. Uh, there's shame put on the girl, but there's a badge of honor put, oh, come on, talk back to me. Y'all know I'm talking right. Huh? He gets another notch in his belt, and she got to carry something. Huh? Oh, y'all ain't talking now. Y'all know I'm talking right. The problem becomes when we don't look at things how God would see them. Sometimes you feel like, how could God be in relationship with me when I'm like this? I'm talking about, see, here, we're not maybe talking about acts. We could be talking about thoughts. See, thoughts can get you in trouble and put you in shame and in guilt. Y you hear me what I'm saying? Look what the woman has done. The voices are shouting. Can you believe she did such a despicable thing? I mean, I can just see these scribes and Pharisees. I, I, I can bet that she was coming toward Jesus, her her shoulders were slumped over and she was downtrodden and she was just embarrassed and, and she was humiliated. She falls to her knees. Her soul is wretched and empty. Hmm? I mean, what do you do when you come before a holy God and then all of a sudden your sins flash before him? But then Jesus, God in the flesh, saw her. His gaze and look at her wasn't of condemnation. See, here's how folk will do you. Folk don't want to pray for you first before they talk about you. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Folks don't want to pray for you first, and then they want to tell you how bad somebody else is to discourage you from praying. Can't we just pray for them? Huh? Can we just pray for them? You know, it's amazing the pushback you get when you pray for somebody that somebody else feels has done something wrong that you don't like. Same Jesus that forgave the woman caught in adultery is the same God that wants to offer you forgiveness. You remember last week when we talked about the book of Joel and we talked about how uh, God is going to restore what the canker worm, the palmer worm, huh? And, 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 and how do we do when we mess up? The first thing we do is say, God, 
or when we mess up with somebody, we say, I'm going to make it right. Isn't that what we say? I'm going to get it right. I'm going to do right. I'm going to make it right. But that might be good theory, but that's not good theology. Because the Bible says, God says, he's going to make it right. Oh, y'all didn't hear me what I'm saying. That's good news right there, is that you don't have to fix your own blunders. That God said, I got you. God said, I'm going to do this. I got you. I'm going to do it for you. He said, I'm going to restore. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to do it. He, he, listen, if he says he's going to do it, that means you don't have to. Somebody shout glory. That, 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 that ought to be good news for somebody because you've been struggling trying to figure out how I'm going to get it back. You know, it's like, God, if you do this, God, if you do this, God, God, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to. No, 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 no. God's got you. What is condemnation or condemning and guilt feel like? What, 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 what does that feel like? I think everybody knows, but I'm just going to remind you. You know, because if you're dealing with guilt and you're dealing with shame and feel that, you know, really there's no way out. I want you to know that you are not alone. Now, you know, you don't want this kind of company, but there's other folk in this, in this, in this course. You know, we've all experienced it. We've all experienced it. Where we feel like I've disappointed God. If you don't think that you've lived a life and you've never disappointed God. Well, you don't know the God that I know because God is so awesome and he's so, and you think, God, how can you use me? How are you going to use me after all I've been through and all I'm doing? And my thought, see, see, the thing is, I can fool myself. That's why I know I can fool you. I'm going to say it again. I'm able to deceive myself. That's why I'm able to deceive you. Have you ever seen people, they look like everything's going on all right, huh? They look like everything is hunky-dory, everything's good, because when you talk to them, how, how you doing? Brother, I'm supernatural. I mean, everything's great. Glory to God. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm living supernatural. Everything's good. But, all of, uh, but inside of my mind, huh, I just walked past them. I said, I just lied to that person, and they have no clue. They have no clue what hell I'm really going through. But there is this honesty, though, when you come before God, just like the woman with the issue. You hear the screams of voices in your head declare that you really are awful. What you just said right there, what you just did is wrong. <laughs> I mean, you wretched. You, you really are beyond hope. You know what? I have been so in a place in fetal position crying because I felt like I didn't add up and I did not meet the mark. I don't know about you, but sometimes you get overwhelmed. But when you're facing guilt and shame, you're really are surrounded by lies of the enemy. The enemy will lie to you. He will, give, you heard me say this for many years. The devil will give you a thought and then he'll condemn you for having the thought. Oh, you're supposed to be a Christian. He, now, he doesn't put it in your mind. Go on, hit him upside the head. Go on, just, just go on, choke her out. Just slap her right now. And, and then you, and then the devil says, see, you're supposed to be a Christian. You, you, what are you doing? Isn't it amazing when Christians try to, non-Christians try to tell you how to be a Christian? Amen. Now, that is the worst. That is the, that is the worst. I thought you was a Christian. What? They always come up with that line. You, 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 I thought you was a Christian. Yeah, right when I'm getting ready to smack you, you want me to be a Christian. <laughs> uh, you know, we just really want to run sometimes and escape to kind of be free. But the lies always seem to pin us down. We can't get away. How, how many of us naturally respond 
to guilt and shame. You know, at first, we, we don't worry about these, these lies that are going on. We, we just close the door off in, in some part of our heart, our mind, and uh, that's really hurting us. You know, when someone hurts you and you don't want to deal with it, you just, you know, departmentalize it and you, you throw it over here. You know, because see, if I deal with it, I might end up divorced. If I deal with it, they might not be my friend no more. If I, if I deal with it, I, I might lose half of my Facebook friends. If I deal with it, they're going to really know who I am, and, and I don't want to deal with the blowback. Hey, hey, you know, guilt and shame, and all you're trying to do is stand up for the right thing. But if you stand up for the right thing in the way you're supposed to, now you become like, now, God, I'm going to be like a hypocrite. But you got to right the record. You got to right the wrong or allow God to do it. But you just say, let me just, let, let's just not deal with that. Let's just keep this aside. We're just going to see if time passes and it goes away. How many times we've done that? We just said, we're just going to let time pass and, and let it go away. That's why in the military, I, I watch, it's not like it was when I was up in. Not as many people get relieved anymore. We used to get relieved all the time. I, I flew in, my first command, I flew into a place, and I'm on the helicopter with the, with the general, and, and the inspection, every inspection we had, there was always a commander on the plane. They dare not do that now. It was a threat. <laughs> and they carried that threat out a lot of times. That's how I got my job. You leaving on this plane, and he's coming in here. We don't want to tell people the truth anymore. So we're living in a time where people can't handle truth, they don't want truth, and when we tell them the truth, you become the victim, you become the villain when truth is told. Amen. I'm not talking about my truth, I'm talking about the truth. Oh, y'all ain't, y'all, no, nah, see, I'm not talking about your opinion, I'm talking about the truth. When the truth comes out, verified, and with, oh, we don't want to deal with it. We just said, let's not deal with that. That's too hurtful. That's too much. We keep pressing and, and we stick our proverbial e uh, fingers in our ears because we don't want to hear the whole truth about it. And so we stock up all of this guilt and all of this shame. No one needs to know about it, right? Nobody needs to know. No one will find out. Uh, we, we, we won't tell anybody about it. But as the days wear on, we find out this terrible truth. Our mistake is not buried behind a closed door. In fact, even if nobody around found out about it, the inner torment con con it, it continues. Because if I don't tell you what it is, don't mean it ain't still going on inside of me. People hurt people all the time, and people are going through all the time, and you don't know it. It's like bruises. Hmm? Now, I don't bruise like some of, some of you other folks with different pigments of skin. But my wife comes up with stuff on her all the time. I could have been in jail many times. And I'm thinking, like, where did that come from? I don't know. I'm thinking, like, bruises everywhere. <laughs> I'm thinking, like, she could be. Matter of fact, one time she did go to the doctor and they was asking her, did, did somebody hurt you? Uh, you, you, know, you, know, you? You know my pain. Oh, yes, sir. You know the pain. And, like, what are you doing running in this stuff or what? Because you, you know you didn't put no. You know, I'm thinking, like, what is really going on here? And see, here's the point. Many of us are bruised like that, but don't see the bruises. You bruise just the same, but you can't see it. You know it's there because you feel it, but you ain't telling nobody. And you're really not dealing with it. <laughs> and the next time we make another bad choice, 
another bad decision. The process starts all over again. It gets worse. We try to talk to somebody about it, but who are we going to talk to? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you feel like I can't talk to nobody about what I'm going through. Because if I talk to somebody about what I'm going through, they're going to judge me just like those men that caught that woman in adultery. They're really going to condemn me. They're going to talk about, well, you weak. And, 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 and why did you let that happen? And and, 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 and and they become to it. Have you ever seen that happen? And, and, and before, they don't come in with, well, brother, let us pray. No, they in on you. It's amazing how carnal Christians are when you hear their plight and hear their pains. How do you find a hope when you're consumed with this guilt and shame? Agape, all of us are going to have to face the aftermath of our, aftermath of our mistakes. I don't care if it's in a marriage. I don't care if it's financial. I don't care if it's with our children. I don't care if it's a moral decline. I don't care if it's in our profession. I don't care if it's a personal decision you've made in your life. huh? You got to deal with it. But unfortunately, many of us have a strategy to get it, and, and it gets stuck in the dark, deep prisons of our life and it becomes condemnation. We, we end up condemning ourselves more than people can ever condemn us. We really do. Because after a while, we say, you know, it's been 30 years and I still not finished my degree. It's been 40 years and I'm still doing the same thing. It's been 50 years and, 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 and you just keep adding to yourself and your sorrow, and you go back to that mistake you made because you've never let it go. You go back to that pain because you really never got over it. You know, in those dark caves, I want to call them, of shame, it keeps us from truly experiencing really the joy of the Lord. We're talking about restoring wasted years. We find ourselves caught and trapped in decisions that were made in the year King Uzziah died. God has forgot about it. Have you ever walked, have, have somebody ever walked up to you and they're talking about, well, you know, I, I'm sorry, you know, what I did. I'm thinking like, and can you tell me what you did? Because you've forgotten about it. You have, you're not keeping record of this stuff. But the problem is the person has kept such a record that every time they see you, they think you're thinking about it, and you have no clue what the heck they're talking about. That's how condemnation works. And, and we ended up condemning ourselves and sentencing ourselves to this. So, so I want to talk about how do we get some hope in this situation? How, do, how does hope come about? That's what I want to talk about this morning. You know, I felt the heaviness of my own guilt and shame. But I want to share with you the hope that's possible. You know, it's good When you just cry out. Have you ever, you know, one of the greatest things I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I looked at Moses when he went up on uh, Mount Sinai. He went up to get the law. You remember that? And he was going up to get the law. He's in the presence of God. God showed him his backside. I mean, he's living in glory, man. And he comes down and Aaron is building a golden calf. 
Man, that make you want to throw up both hands and holler. Do, can I tell you something? Sometimes you need to just throw up both hands and scream. Hmm? We come to church in the midst of praise and worship, but we want to give God one of these little cute praises. Huh? Sometimes you just need to holler. Y'all didn't hear me what I'm saying. Sometimes you need to scream. In the midst of worship, sometimes you just need to cry out to God. Huh? Because what it is, you need to purge your own soul. Because the devil's wearing you out between your ears. He's giving you thoughts. He's condemning you for having them. You're just a wicked, bad person. If you don't do this, if you don't do that, you wicked, you bad. If you do this, you do that, you wicked and bad. You, no matter which way you turn, you're wicked and bad. You're just a terrible person. And then now you have bought the lie and you call yourself that. Your self-esteem is gone. Huh? You, you don't believe in yourself no more. I've seen people that are very gorgeous to look at, very beautiful to look at, but they think they're ugly because they've been told they're ugly so long. They've been beaten so much that they just don't feel like nobody would want them. Y'all know anybody like that? I'm telling you, it happens. And you get, no make no difference. How many mirrors you put up to them, no matter how many people you say, man, isn't she beautiful? Isn't he a handsome guy? He, they would never hear it because they're overburdened and overwhelmed Watch this now. The very first step in the process to processing our shame in a real healthy way is to make a critical distinction. You need to write this down. Am I dealing with conviction or am I dealing with condemnation? Listen, listen. am I dealing with conviction or am I dealing with condemnation? What is conviction? Conviction is God's prompting in our heart to make a decision that brings us closer fellowship with him. So what I'm hearing in my spirit, what I'm hearing in my mind, whatever's going on with me, it should be bringing me closer to God if it's conviction. God allows us to feel conviction so that we can live Humbly. Conviction humbles you. It brings you to a place of humility. And it brings us into righteous living with God. And we've got to hear God's voice that convicts us. Conviction is a very important aspect of the Christian life. We can't have God's grace without conviction. The Spirit guides us gently in the right direction we need to go. We couldn't grow spiritually without the promptings in life that tells us, no, -uh, not here, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Those things are convictions. Since conviction comes from God, it has got to be based in love. I'm going to say it again. Conviction is based in love. So then what is condemnation? Condemnation, on the other hand, is negative. It's negative. It's destructive. It's a destructive thought pattern that seeks to do nothing but to undermine our self-esteem, our self-confidence, and it kills us. Think about the last time you said, God, I just don't know how you love me. I just should be finished with this. I can't get through with this. You have bought the lie that God doesn't love you, that God won't forgive you. Huh? If he forgave the woman, he'll forgive you. It fills our heart with phrases like, you ain't going to never break this pattern. Your mama was like this. Huh? Look at your sisters. Huh? Look, look at your brothers, huh? Look where you came from, huh? Everybody you know like this, huh? <laughs> Victim mentality, huh? 
guilt and shame not only takes over people, it takes over communities. Huh? Guilt and shame. You walk up to somebody, you think somebody getting ready to do something wrong to you. Your mind is already there. They don't like me. You never met this person, but you've already drawn the conclusion. They don't like me. Because you've been hurt so many times. You, you know, it's just like, you, you know, I, if you, you, anybody ever broke, my wife broke her foot. If you ever break your foot, that's the worst thing to happen to you. People can see a knee brace. They can see my big boot when I broke my, uh, tore my Achilles. They, you can see all of that, right? We can see all that stuff. But when you break your foot, you, you, you know, you're coming back and you got your shoe on now. The devil will tell you everybody here today is getting ready to step on your foot. And so you run around like this. Don't, don't, you know, you know, everybody, you know, everybody's intentionally, you know, coming for your foot. That's how many people live their life in day-to-day -day processes. You think about it. They meet a person, a person trying to be nice to them, and the first thing you said, what do they want from me? They're just trying to be nice to you. What do you want from me? You're a horrible person. You should have been over this by now. Those voices will tell you. This is not guiding you toward God. Condemnation will never guide you toward God. Instead, condemnation is a prison. It, 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 it's a breaking down of your spirit. And when your spirit is broke, you're wasting time. You're wasting time. Instead of being where you need to be, you're wasting time. Your, your, your marriage is never going to get better. Your situation is never going to get better. Your life is never going to get better. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if the devil can make you think you're not worth it, if the devil makes you think everybody's coming after me, nobody likes me, every, no, no, no. There are some things in your life and the prompts that you've missed in conviction that you should have moved into humility and on the right track with God. And if you were in the presence of God, guess what would happen? You would not be able to hear the voices of that kind of stuff. But Jesus describes two distinct patterns of guidance in a parable of the sheep and the wolves. In John 10 and 10, here's what he says. He says, the thief comes to do what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. He said, I come that you may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Abundant life comes in Christ. Abundant, crime, abundant life comes in love. And you know what? This sounds crazy. It almost sounds narcissistic in a way, but it's biblical. The Bible says, love your neighbors as you love yourself. Can I tell y'all something? If I ever float up on the bank of a river, don't look for no suicide note because I didn't kill myself. <laughs> I love me. <laughs> Would y'all tell us about it? That man loves some John Allen Neal. I love me. I love myself. So since I love myself so much, you know, I'm able to love somebody else. I don't want you love your neighbor as you love yourself. I don't want you loving me if you don't be loving you. I'm going to say it again. I said, I don't want you loving me if you don't love you. And that's so important that we come to this place that we begin to know the difference between conviction and condemnation. I'm going to give you four things that's going to help us to, to freedom 
from guilt and shame. How, how can you tell if you're face, what you're facing is true conviction from God or condemnation or from the enemy? Remember I told you, conviction will always move you where? Closer to God. And how can we remove the heaviness of guilt after we made a whole bunch of bad choices. Number one, ask God to help you clarify where the guilt and shame is coming from. I'm going to say it again. Ask God, where is this coming from? Where is all of this self-hatred why is, why, listen, listen, this is a true story. I was driving down the street. I called my wife, uh, and, and, and that was crazy. You know, when you're growing up as a young boy or young girl, you know what's the most important thing to a girl coming up is that their boyfriend is what? Huh? Oh, no. Girls don't care nothing about no rich. You're talking about a woman. A girl, a girl don't care nothing about no rich. You got to be cute. Huh? And so, you know, you know, coming up, coming up through school, you know, my brother was taller, huh? My sister kept telling us he's the best looking. This is my ugly brother. This is my, yeah, didn't you say it? He's a basketball player, you know, a lot of kind of stuff. He's tall, ain't like these guys here. You know, they ain't had no problem back there in the back, on the back row. They, they ain't having no problem in high school. And then, 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 see, when you get a little older, They quit looking at your face. Oh, they said, that boy right there is bad. They can tell where he moved, he love himself. They can tell where he moved, he, he, he got it going on. Do you know everything? I was riding down the street, and I said, shoot. See, that went over some of y'all's head. You remember that song? <laughs> where they said, shoot. They said, I look so good, shoot. Oh, I was... I was looking in the rearview mirror. I said, oh, shoot. <laughs> Saw myself. I said, Lord, have mercy. Boy, don't you look good. Uh, hey, hold up here. I had to change my narrative. Huh? If I don't think I look good, nobody else would. And then my sister pulled it one time too many. This is my good looking uh, brother. And this is my ugly brother. My wife said, if you talk about my husband one more time, Oh, Jesus. I said, no, nah, nah, I'm fine for real now. <laughs> Y'all follow me what I'm saying? You can get beat down and believe the narrative. Huh? I know I'm not Billy D. Y'all don't know Billy D. But I feel like Billy D. <laughs> yeah. Now, see, my wife said, I look better than Billy D. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Number one, one more time. You got to ask God. We serve a good, a good God. He wants to help us untangle the confusing emotions we got going on in our life. To go into a quiet place. You know, we're reading the book that I gave all the leaders, The Secret Place. That book is so good. To go into a secret place once again where you can, you know, when you go into the secret place, you don't have to say anything. Prayer, with prayer is communication, but why did it mean you have to say something? Let him say something to you. Just sit and listen 
to see in the space that you have come and let God minister you. Don't rush the process. Sometimes you just read his word. Don't say nothing. Just listen. You got to remember that God is on our side. You know, God is on our side. If he can be for me, who can be against me? Listen, I believe that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You got to begin to talk to yourself and tell yourself, greater is he that's in me, that's he that's in the world. I'm more than a conqueror. Come on here. Second point, I'm about finished, is separate conviction from condemnation. You know, during this time, God is going to show you that your feelings of guilt and shame are complex sometimes. Sometimes they're mixed with both condemnation and conviction. You, you may not be able, you're trying to figure out what's going on here. All of that's good, but you know one thing about conviction? Conviction will always, always lead you to God. It will always lead you to a positive place in God. And do not let the devil give you a thought, condemn you for having it. Don't, don't listen, do not let the enemy speak to you about stuff he knows nothing about. Just like those people that you come across, you know, young people come across it all the time and they're witnessing, I thought you was a Christian. Yeah, when you get older, you don't use that line so much. But, that, that, but people do. They, they want to try to tell. I thought you were a Christian. What, what do you know about a Christian? Number three, learn from the conviction. And you got to be, you, and, and you got to restate or reword or rephrase the condemnation. You got to remember that God can use the feeling of guilt and shame for a good purpose. You know, what, 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 what are the healthy things, what healthy uh, things is God trying to share with you? You know, what do we say? Uh, we can um, eat the meat and what? Throw out the bones. You know, you know, when someone is coming at you and they're being in a, condemn, in a condemning way, some of what they're saying may be good stuff. Huh? You can take it, and you can, but you got to work through here what's happening. Huh? Even a person that calls themselves a man or woman of God can bring condemnation and they ain't bringing conviction. Because a man can't bring conviction, only Holy Spirit can bring conviction. And you got to watch who you allow to speak into your life. You got to watch who you ask advice from. You, you better watch who you, you know, I, I remember my wife walking up to somebody in a tragic part of her life. Her mother had just died and she asked a bishop a question. She says, well, I just can't, you know, what's going on? I just can't, you know, my, my daughter had died. Our daughter had died. And I just can't get over the death of my daughter. And she said, you need to be over that by now. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. A bishop in the Lord's church said, you need to be over that by now. Well, you know what? In that situation, you can take some of it, leave, leave my baby alone now. Don't, 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 you know, just pat and hug. Grace. Thank you. Grace, mama, grace, grace. And they, they, and they won't even remember me when they're 13. <laughs> but anyway, in those situations that you face like that, it could have been something else that someone told you in the midst of your trouble. Isn't that a wicked thing to say? But how do you deal with it? As a child of God, I, I, I no longer identify uh, by my mistakes, but I'm identified by what God says I am. Just like that woman, God said, listen, 
go and sin no more. I, I, I'm identified by that. You can't, you know, people say, but what, what do you do? I, you know what I love? I love people that know my past to come and talk about my past. Because you know what it does? It don't do nothing but, but a testimony about how good God is. Yes. People want to, you know, you know, and that's like I said, my brother and I missed our 50th reunion was this year. Our 50th high school reunion was this year. But we didn't go. And the only reason why I didn't go, I had to. I, I tried that. That didn't work too well. I looked at me like, he's asking my brother and I, like, who's that old person over there? I said, it's our classmate. Shh. <laughs> she just like, who that? The teacher? I mean, come on, man. So that's why we just said we're going to leave 50 alone because it's going it, it to be really bad up here. <laughs> yeah, after 10 years, it's going to be really bad up in here. <laughs> so we said, don't send me no letter, no card. I'm not coming. <laughs> oh, God. You know, you know, but when I think about life and how life is, life People can say things, it can be true, but not condemning. But if you take it as condemnation, you will feed it into condemnation, and there you go. Everything that someone says is not condemning you. And you got to be willing. And guess what? Holy Spirit will always convict you. Baby, you need to listen right there. Oh, I don't want to listen to that. No, that you need to listen. I don't want to listen. Number four, I'm going to stop right here. Let go of the guilt and shame. Somebody shout, let it go. Let it go. One more time, shout, let it, go. let it go. Look, once God has revealed any conviction and you're asking for forgiveness and you're asking for him to help, he shows you how to rework the condemnation into truth. You can walk in forgiveness and freedom. I want you to turn to Galatians 5 and 1. Those thoughts of guilt and shame don't have to plague you forever. They don't. God's Word says that when he sets us free. We're free indeed. In Galatians, is what it says, chapter one, um, chapter five, and verse one. It says, "Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage." Did y'all hear that? Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout glory. That's good news right there. That's good news right there. That's good news. That's good news. Now, look at me. I, I, want, you to, I, want, you, I want you to get something. Say, I'm free, I'm free. from the bondage, from the bondage of, condemnation. of condemnation. I'm free from that. I'm free from that. See, see people are trying to break family curses generational curses, huh? There are people that, that mama was in the projects, huh? Everybody lived in the projects, huh? Trying to break it, huh? There, there, there are situations where th there's been infidelity and children in every little place there's been there, and no one's broken it. There's been a place where there's no marriage, but you're saying, listen, my marriage is going to make it, huh? I'm breaking the cycle. There's there's place where no houses, no one owned any property. You said, no, I'm breaking that. Huh? Huh? There, there's a situation, come on now, where men are saying, my, you know, my father left me. I'm going to stay in my house. Oh, come on here. I'm going to break the cycle Amen. of condemnation and bondage. Yes. Somebody shout glory. glory. Isaiah 42 and verse 6 and 7, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in 
righteousness. The Lord has called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for, the, for a light of the Gentiles, huh? To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison. Somebody shout glory. And them that sat in darkness out of the prison house. I believe that the word of God, if you would apply it to your life, you can come out of this. You can break the cycle. Come on. You can break the chains. But you got to be willing to say, I'm no longer going to be a victim of nobody. I'm not going to be a victim. You're not going to prejudge me. I'm not going to be prejudged in this stuff in my head that you're not going to do this. You can't do this. This can't be done. That's not going to happen. No, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hosea 14 and 4. Come on, 14 and 4. It says, I will heal the, their, their backsliding. He says, I will heal their backsliding. Did you hear that? I will heal their backside and I will love them freely for my anger is turned away from them. Do you know God will love you in the midst of your mess if you allow yourself to be loved? See, some of you, you've been lying, believed the lie so long, you start to help the devil hate you. You better get a shoot moment in your life and start loving yourself. You better start looking in yourself, and every time you look in the mirror, you better say, I'm wonderfully and skillfully made. Huh? Come on here. Huh? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Sometimes you got to say to yourself, I, you know, I remember, I remember when, 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 when my territory uh, was really expanding. You, you remember that coach? You know, coach, coach looking at me probably, you know, being the, being the physical ed teacher saying, my pastor don't look too physically fit. But I still loved myself when I was real big and real small. It don't matter. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to love me regardless of what you see, he see, they see, is what me see. Me see wonderfully and skillfully made. Come on. Y'all better give God some glory up in this place. God is a good God. He loves you no matter what you're going through, no matter what, you, what you're facing, no matter what is happening, no matter how many times you figure like, oh, God, I've been going through this forever. When is it going to stop? It's going to stop when you stop. When you stop crying and stop, start celebrating God. We, we, we cry, celebrate God. You better be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If he don't, he's able. You better, you better serve God and praise him uh, like, 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 like you don't need him to be a genie in a bottle. If God don't do nothing else for you, which is not biblically sound, but if he doesn't, is he done enough for you to shout to the end until he comes? See, anybody can love him when things are going right. But are you going to love him when things are not going right? See, see, when the church is crowded and, 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 it's, and we're overflowing with three services, oh, we're jumping around. I'm jumping around now. Because guess what? I ain't doing half the counseling I used to do to people that wasn't listening to me anyway. <laughs> Y'all ain't talking back to me. Huh? I'm playing more golf now because I ain't talking to dead, stiff-necked people that are not listening to me anyway. Boy, I can see good in everything. Every little thing you do, I can see God. Huh? Well, this morning... Sister, let me ask you a question. Are you, you're not being deployed. They, they, you're not, praise the Lord. I'm so glad you don't have to go. That is so wonderful. I'm glad you don't have to go. All right. Uh, I, I just hate deployments. I do. Maybe I'm chauvinistic, but I just don't like women in combat. Is that, is that bad? 
Because I, I, it hasn't happened yet, but these guys are ruthless. Huh? They don't play like we play. Huh? They would love to get a woman and drag them through the square. They don't care. Because you know what men do when that kind of stuff happens? No, Bishop, you shouldn't say that. This is chauvinist. No. When you take one of the sisters, you take one of the girls, men will make, take unnecessary risks to go get them. They'll put everybody in danger to go get, because it's in us to do that. But I'm so glad you know, I was praying. To sh- oh, I pray this child don't have to go. I mean, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. Listen, I want to pray uh, for um, Elder Coley. I know she's watching. She's at home today. I want to pray for her. I want to pray for Pastor Hike. You know, Pastor Hike had a bone marrow transplant, and his son was the donor. But that was wonderful. But he's, he's struggling with the chemo, and, and we're praying that, you know, there's a, I think it's a, maybe a month or two where, it, where you know, where it's critical that, the, that it, what it takes, that it takes. So we're praying that it doesn't reject. Uh, you remember when we was on the prayer line, they gave him just weeks to live, told him go home and take care of his business. But look at it now. He, he got a bone marrow transplant, looking at life. More. Uh, pastor Hill, our other pastor in the Netherlands, I'm going to go see him this weekend, this week as we go to the Netherlands. He has the same similar. It's, got, it's called aplastic anemia. Oh, God, man. He can't make his own blood. It is terrible. Do you know life is in the blood? And so we need to pray for them. And then uh, uh, Elder Coley's having a problem with her spleen. All of these things are blood related and that sort of thing. We just need to pray that the power of Jesus Christ uh, would just um, just move on their lives. Can we do that? And those that are listening, can we pray for these three people? I just believe God wants to touch them uh, right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for these three and anyone else right now in our listening audience and that's right here today. Come on, everybody stand. That, that, that loves, that, 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 that is in pain and going through something, particularly something life-threatening uh, like these we're going through. I pray by the Spirit of the living God, uh, Father, that you would heal and deliver. I pray that every organ and every tissue in her body would function into perfection in which you created to function. Let them be healed and whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a hand of praise. Thank you all so much for being with us. And before you go, and before you go, Hey, listen, we just got back from the Ukraine. What we're going to do, we're going to talk to you more about it as we try to drum up to get some supplies in before the winter. We're going to need your support again. Uh, you know, we don't do, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, uh, begging you. I'm going to tell you what we need once they tell me. I'm not just asking for money. I need to know how much money we need. And when, see, because I believe God is a God of specificity. I need $20,000. I, you know, somebody write a check for 10. Somebody write a check for 15. Let, I'm not sitting here wasting all day. Come on, because I know somebody say everything we need, everything we need. Is, in the house. is in the house. I know that's right. I know that's right. Every single thing we need is in the house. And so I believe the house has expanded to those of you, and it's proven that watch us online, and, and it's been so many, many more that's here that watch us, and we thank you so much for coming in and being a part of what we do. Go in on our give button. Listen, if you're not a member of a church, listen, do not send, if you're a member of a church, do not send your tithes to this church. Don't do it. Take them to your church. But if you are in between churches or you just been out since COVID and you haven't found a church, you're still here, I'm not going to put you in condemnation. I'm going to tell you, you need to find a good Bible-believing church. You need to find a pastor. Many of you all left here and say, I can't find a church like this. The devil is a liar. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. There is a church with your name on it, so you find it. But in the meantime, you can support us, and we do accept your free uh, will get. Uh, free will gifts and love offerings. And we thank you so much for it. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Thank